Welcome to the 241st episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney, and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome. I hope you're ready for the Super Bowl. I hope you're ready for a plant-strong Super Bowl party. Some suggestions to start you off with. How about taking those little potatoes, boiling them, scooping out a little bit, stuffing them with hummus? can do the same thing with plum tomatoes. Our black bean fiesta soup is a great soup to have with corn tortillas. That would be a great uh, soup to have. Obviously, our desserts, the banana bread or the carrot cake muffins would be a good one. How about brownie bites for dessert? Probably do burrito bowls here with, uh, again, homemade corn tortillas. I don't know if you've ever made them, but all you have to do is get corn masa. Corn masa is cooked Corn, dehydrate it. You take corn, masa, and water, roll those out, makes a fabulous corn tortilla. Uh, put all your, your toppings on there, make a fresh salsa, you're good to go. Cauliflower buffalo wings and your favorite buffalo sauce, that's also uh, another option. And then some of our favorite hors d'oeuvres would be the carrot dogs made into little pigs in the blanket. So I take our pizza crust that we make, uh, the pizza dough, and roll that out really thin and wrap little carrots that have been marinated in that um, and bake those for a little bit. Fabulous. Of course, pizza's always good. So plenty of plant-strong things. You need to get your greens in those. So I suggest the sushi salad. It's one of my favorites. Uh, and then we made a salad that was great today in class that I really, really liked. It was parsley, spinach, pomegranate seeds, apples. Pick your flavor of apple chopped up fine, and we made a Dijon dressing with a Dijon mustard, a rice, or, um, apple cider vinegar, garlic, and a little bit of maple syrup. Fabulous. So great, great tasty salad. So you want to have your greens with your, you know, your football food or your more of your fun food. So I hope you enjoy. Hope you get your run in and some exercise before the football game. It's not till afternoon, so don't get stuck between uh, in front of the TV. I'm sorry that my vegan Tennessee Titans didn't make it, but uh, there are some good people to root for, so it should be a, a, an exciting game. As for me, I'm two weeks out for the Austin Marathon. Look out, Lance Armstrong. You're going to have trouble catching me for a little bit. Um... So two weeks out, have some runs tomorrow. It's predicted rain here, but I'm going to do it. going to go out in the rain and get my run ends, uh, a fair, fair number of miles at marathon pace to hope to get my head ready. Um, I think my coach, Wes, is preparing my head more than anything at this point because it hasn't been too long since uh, uh, the other marathon. So it's just a matter of getting used to running that little pace. I've noticed that my easy pace is a faster pace now. And, you know, it kind of feels weird to be running a little faster clip, but breathing easy. So I have to get used to that, I'm trying to get some more gears in, because if I, as I've said before, I've got my really easy slog pace, and I've got my push it to the limit pace, but I'm trying to figure out what the middle of those couple extra, add a couple extra gears. So I've been practicing those extra gears, I think I'm working on getting a 10K pace in there a little bit so I can kind of feel the difference. So that's all fun. Doing a little bit of weight training, not a lot, not as much as I should. I actually had a virus um, last weekend. So if you noticed, my nose was kind of stuffy on the last podcast. But I, um, I really put it to bed pretty quick. Just really bumped my citrus up and bumped my garlic up and just all kinds of antioxidants. So lots of greens, lots of good food. Everything I stuck in my mouth, I wanted it to be to go towards healing me and getting rid of that virus. So I, I um, think I've, I've gone a long way to do that. And we're going to talk about flavonoids and how they actually inhibit a virus from attaching to the cell wall. So what you eat really can alter how you recover from an illness because, you know, we're all exposed to bugs this time of year and you know, it's, um, it, it, it's hard to, to keep away from it. I also noticed that when, you know, I start running and I'm, I'm a huge advocate of breathing through your nose, even at nighttime, I made a conscious effort to really breathe through my nose, take nice diaphragmatic breaths, and you release nitric oxide from your nose. So my, I never really had that nose stuffiness that 
you know, inhibited me from breathing. Had a little bit of a cough tickle from some posterior sinus stuff, but that really, uh, again, hasn't lasted long. A little bit of hoarseness, some people like that, so I can't talk, but um, that all seems to be gone, and my run's back to uh, baseline. This past Monday, I was up in Winter Haven, t- uh, call out to the crew at Chat and Chew, and, and Kathy Thornhill and, and her group and all those people up there, um, they were the most gracious host I think that I've ever been involved with. They made me feel so special to be up there speaking at, at their group. They did a wonderful cooking demonstration. Uh, with um, They made the cowboy caviar and the brownie bites and the broccoli soup from our cookbook. And then they made a, an, another rainbow salad. Uh, it was just great, and their description was, was really, really good. Um, and just, you know, a, a big thank you to them for, for being uh, such great hosts. And in addition, I met two very special, actually four runners. One uh, is in her 80s, and, and we're going to talk next week, and, and, and they're going to be on the, the podcast because I, I want to highlight just such positivity in runners and plant-based eaters that I think it'll be uh, really motivating for everybody. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And so that's all my, uh, my good news until I start in ranting and raving here uh, a little bit. Not, not too bad, but I, I feel a rant coming on uh, later in the podcast. Before I get started on that, we are selling tickets to our fifth annual Charlotte County Plant-Based Nutrition Conference, and they are going more rapidly this year than they even did last year. So um, if you'd like to join us for a great day of plant-based education, nutrition, cooking demonstrations, Pam Popper's going to be there, Karen Hartglass, our very own registered dietitian, Addie Minerich. Um, we're going to have plant-based breakfast and lunch that'll knock your socks off in a beautiful location in Port Charlotte Beach Complex. So come and join us. Uh, again, hop on over to drdelaney.com. It's D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y and get your tickets. If you really, really, really want to take a vacation and spend it with us and be immersed in plant-based nutrition and really change your life, get your exercise up so that you're ready to take on that marathon like my 80-year-old friends that are coming on, or you're ready to take on that big trip and just really up your fitness, up your nutritional knowledge, up your health, then come join us for the week before the conference for an immersion week. You can get that information again on drdelaney.com or even give us a call. There's a number on the website. But we'd love to have you because we're going to spend the week with you. And it's going to be all about you. It's going to be all about um, uh, private consultations with myself and the registered dietitian. It's going to be all about cooking, education, science education, fun activities, getting together and exercising because there's nothing better than having a group of like-minded people to push each other uh, to achieve new boundaries and, um, you know, learn something about people from other places. So please uh, check that out and and come down and join us. So let's get started. Did you get your flavonoids today? Do you know what flavonoids are? Well, there was a study done in the Journal of Neurology. I guess it was published in the Journal of Neurology that looked at flavonoids and how they might lower Alzheimer's risk. And they looked at 921 adults that were over 80, and they followed them for six years. And the people that had the most flavonoids, the highest flavonoid intake, were 50% like, less likely to develop Alzheimer's. They looked at four flavonoids in particular. So flavonoids, are they come from plants. Interestingly, the phytonutrients and antioxidants that we get from eating plants were originally for the plants to protect them from the bugs and worms and to keep them alive because they can't run from danger. And the four flavonoids that they looked at um, were camphorol, which the one of the some of the main um, vegetables that camphorol comes from kale, beans, tea, spinach, broccoli. Um, They looked at quercetins coming that come from tomatoes, kale, we know apples, teas, um, my seat, um, Amir Seaton, uh, tea, wine, kale, orange, tomatoes, and then uh, I saw ham nitin, uh, which come from pears, olive oil, wine, tomato sauce. 
And so by looking at all these, they noticed that um, the quercetin wasn't really tied, or they couldn't really um, look in the dietary histories and, and tie that to Alzheimer's. But the the biggest one was the camphorol uh, had the greatest reduction in Alzheimer's, a 51% reduction in people that had the highest um, dosage. And that was like 15 milligrams a day. And they had, um, that was three times the average, uh, three times more than the average of the lowest intake people. And so 15% of those people versus 54% in the lowest group developed Alzheimer's. The mercetin, again, tea, wine, kale, oranges, tomatoes, 38% reduction. Um, in, in Alzheimer's risk. So, you know, take that for, um, you know, these paleo people that are worried about getting plants and, you know, um, because only, again, only plants provide us with these antioxidants and, and phytonutrients that we need as, as defense mechanism for things that happen to us, um, such as colds and flus, as well as lifestyle diseases. So just what are these flavonoids that, you know, are, are so abundant in fruits, vegetables, grains, bark, roots, stems, flowers, teas, uh, and even wine? Uh, they have antioxidative properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-mutagenic properties. That means, you know, decreased DNA damage, anti-carcinogenic properties, decrease the blood vessel growth into tumors, uh, decrease the promotion of cancers. They improve cellular enzyme functions. When we say antioxidants, we mean, you know, the process of living, we have byproducts and metabolic waste, and we generate these oxidants or free radicals that cause harm to our, our cells. So these, these flavonoids help protect against that. There's been associated with, um, decreased risk in cardiovascular disease with flavonoid intake, Alzheimer's, as we talked about, cancers, the structure is a polyphenolic. You know, when I was in um, college, organic chemistry was the subject. I, I really hated the worst. I loved all other chemistries, and I was actually a chemistry major. But organic chemistry, I just really, really didn't like. And it's so funny that all this, these uh, structures are coming back to haunt me. But uh, the, the phenolic structure in plants, vegetables, and wine are, are actually what they all have in common. They inhibit enzymes such as xanthine oxidase and cyclooxygenase. Again, the development of free radicals, lipooxygenase, phosphatidyl, um, I'm sorry, phosphoenacetidyl 3 kinase, which are all things that end up causing cellular damage. The flavonoids can be divided down into uh, chalcones, uh, flavones, flavonoids, isoflavonoids, and isoflavones. And, and basically, these flavonoids, it, it's what gives plants their color and their aroma. Um, and, and in a plant world, again, they, they protect the plant against predators, but they also attract pollinators. So it's, it's what helps the, the, the plant to ultimately fruit. In humans, they also act as antimicrobials uh, and provide um, the plant defense against things like frost and drought and temperature acclimation and hot and cold. So you can see how these things, when we eat them, provide us with such defenses as well. Other vegetables that are high in flavonoids, celery, parsley, which we had today in our salad, red peppers, chamomile, mint, even ginkgo biloba, the peels of citrus fruit. So if you have a cold, using some of the lemon peel uh, is really, really good. Adding the peel or the rime or the zest into your pancakes in the morning is a great way to add some of this uh, flavonoids into your food. They've also been shown to decrease inflammation in general, decrease cholesterol, decrease lipids. Isoflavonoids, soybeans and legumes. So, you know, that's the big controversial um, subject with soy. Is it causing a problem? Does it cause breast cancer? Does it prevent against breast cancer? And the, actual, the answer is it's very protective. Um, countries that eat a lot of soy have lower incidence of breast cancer, lower incidence of prostate cancer. Genistein and datazine are the phytoestrogens. Phyto meaning estrogen-like, so they actually block the estrogen receptor and provide protection. Anthocyanins uh, are flavonoid that act uh, that actually give the pigments uh, and the color to berries, such cranberries, black currants, 
grapes, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries. There's also a um, benefit of flavonoids that they um, actually block an enzyme called aldose reductase, which is used in the treatment of diabetes. They help in protecting people uh, to develop this antibiotic resistance. So people that are typically eating a standard American diet that get uh, milk, uh, then has been exposed to antibiotics or meat products that have been, uh, you know, the animals have been treated with antibiotics. Those, it's like getting a dose of antibiotics every time they, they take those things in. So when they actually get an infection, a lot of times they're very resistant. So, you know, even in a meat eater, if you can, you know, have your friends increase their intake of, of the fruits and vegetables, that's, that helps them overcome antibiotic resistance. It helps to activate the insulin receptor so that it, that's, that's the, one of the other mechanisms that it helps uh, to, to um, um, make people more glucose tolerant that have diabetes. As we talked about earlier, it keeps that flu virus from binding to the cells and it helps uh, stimulate good immune response activation and decreases abnormal um, immune responses. It's even been shown to improve the lung architecture uh, in, in those affected with flu viruses to help them um, get over it quicker. So again, if you get the creeping crud that's going around, a virus or influenza, it's really important to start looking at your flavonoid intakes, look at all, you know, I, I think it's, you know, when you're not feeling quite right, it's really easy to get in more fruit. And, you know, this is a great time of year, it's in season. Uh, to push the citrus, push the oranges. I'm going to make a plug for our little Florida oranges. Um, you know, you've heard of the cuties and the halos. Well, we Florida now has their own variety. I think they're much better than than, than some of the other ones. So go ahead and try our Florida variety of the uh, of the small mandarin oranges. Uh, really, really great. There's also um, associated increased nitric oxide synthase. So when we talk about eating greens, such as kale and cabbage and uh, broccoli and cauliflower, these are, some of these other vegetables also um, have increased nitric oxide production that have increased flavonoids. So, you know, again, green tea, uh, very, very healthy. Um, I've even been known to put the green tea leaves in my teff, you know, get the matcha tea and put a little bit of that in my teff. Um, when I make that or in the oatmeal, you can make desserts and add a little bit of the matcha tea to that. It's going to get you uh, uh, a little bit uh, more antioxidants. Quercetins that are in, uh, um, in uh, apples in particular, lower blood pressure. Also been shown to decrease tumor cell growth in vitro and, you know, when you look at uh, cell growth in the culture. Decrease LDL cholesterol as well. Fenugreek seeds have been shown to improve uh, kidney function and, and um, especially in uh, people and, and improve um, pancreatic lipase function in, in alcoholics. So what might that look like in somebody's daily diet? Um, how about starting, you know, a breakfast with some chia seeds and adding pomegranate seeds, blueberries, papaya, grapefruit, oranges, pineapple. How about having an apple after lunch, um, a big kale salad? Again, that salad we had today in class, parsley, spinach, apple, Dijon mustard, apple cider vinegar. What about a dinner with beans and rice on collards? Have some spinach or broccoli. So, I mean, there's so many just to look at dessert with some more berries, perhaps some more citrus. So there's, there's you know, when I, when I look at my plate is how can, how can I help myself? How can I, you know, how can I use food as medicine? As opposed to, you know, maybe many, many, many years ago, you know, the days of ho-hos and uh, Twinkies, what tastes good when you feel bad? You know, you feel bad, you crumple up into a ball and you have some hot Limpton, hot Limpton, Limpton tea and, uh, you know, something sweet doesn't do you any good. So I think people that take longer to recover from viruses 
um, you have to look at what they're what they're actually eating. You know, you have to up your game. You know, when something's attacking, uh, attack back with some of these great, great foods. As I was scrolling through some things on Twitter to get ready for this podcast, I came across a post that mentioned this Dr. Paul Saladino, and he is a carnivore, and apparently there was some big rant on some YouTube channel that I did not go and watch, but I did look up Dr. Paul Saladino. It's funny that his name is Salad Dino. Dr. Saladino is relatively new to the medical field since he's only been in practice uh, less than three years. He's a psychiatrist by training, but, um, uh, you know, has turned carnivore uh, diet promoting blogger, um, I guess, uh, instead of actually doing something uh, that, you know, a uh, little, little bit more psychiatry and talk therapy, anti uh, psychiatric medications would be a great alternative, perhaps, uh, ways to help people uh, with diet and exercise with their mental illness. But anyway, he has taken um, this carnivore that we were meant, and he, he's basically taken every reason why plant-based people say we're plant-based and kind of turned them backwards, but without any backing. So there was even a mention that uh, we have shorter intestines than we used to have, you know, because as plant-based people, we say we have much longer intestines than dogs or cats. Um, you know, and he blames eating plants for all our woes, even saying that these uh, flavonoids that I talk so much about can actually cause problems. Um, there, there, there's no scientific study to that. Again, you know, most of these uh, flavonoids, fruits, plants uh, actually decrease cancer, increase, improve health and well-being. And it was, it's, it was kind of crazy because he, you know, says these things without any kind of, of uh, backup or any kind of, you know, um, citations at, at all. But the best quote, the best quote that I think just lays it to rest right up front and just tells me exactly where Dr. Saladino is coming from. There's a quote saying, three generations back, ancestors were killing animals by hand and eating nose to tail. So basically eating the whole animal three generations back. Okay, so when I go three generations back, that puts it to my great-grandfather. And I... I, I I know this, you know, I come from West Virginia, Pennsylvania border. My grandparents, my dad and my grandparents and my great-grandparents hunted. And um, they, you know, that puts us back into the 40s, 30s, 40s. People hunted with guns back then, not by hand. And it wasn't... Um, uh, nobody ate noses back then, nose to tail. They weren't starving in order to eat every, you know, when you say nose to tail. Now, I will say that when my grandparents butchered hogs, they used a lot of the animal. Um, you know, people have eaten um, the um, scalp meat and mince pies. And, of course, you know, I've heard of eating beef heart and pig's feet and chicken feet. I didn't ever eat chicken feet or pig's feet. Um, but, you know, an oxen tail, those, those things uh, exist. You know, how people need to go back to eating organ meat, which have the highest cholesterol of any, any part of the animal. Um, but, you know, head to tail and, and killing animals by hand um, I, I, I'm sure, I guess it's just because he's young and doesn't realize three generations ago people were driving cars and using uh, rather sophisticated weapons, uh, both in war and in hunting. Um, typically, uh, hunters, they use, they, you know, they, you, if you're, you know, if you've never been hunting, you go out in the early morning before the animal starts to move and you stake out your place in the woods where the animal's most likely to go through. Um, if you're duck hunting, there might be a blind near the water or 
If you're deer hunting, you know, you're into the brush kind of behind so that you're not sticking out. Animals don't see color. Um, if you're turkey hunting, again, you're waiting quietly in the woods, not talking, same way with squirrels, uh, and you wait for the animal to come by and you shoot the animal. That's how it goes. And um, nobody ate squirrel tail uh, in the, my three generations back. Um, you know, pretty particular about uh, what parts of the deer uh, that people ate. They, they did not eat organ meat uh, of the wild animals that they killed. Um, there was some fear of contamination, even three generations, you know, back. So the fact that somebody, you know, gives this as a reason why we should be carnivore because we could tear animals with our bare hands, it doesn't exist. Um, we need, and, and, and the other thing he talks about, we don't need fiber, that fiber is actually harmful. Well, we know places in the world that eat the most fiber don't have colon disease. They don't. And he even goes the other way around and says that's actually what causes the problem. So there's absolutely nothing to back this up. It's all about getting people, um, you know, to jump on the caveman wagon. Uh, and again, people did not live as long uh, when, um, you know, back in the day they lived, they were hoping to live to reproduce in the caveman era, in the paleo era, uh, in the, you know, 17, 1600s. That's all. The, the average lifespan was, it was not what it was today. So don't go down that road of, of the carnivore diet. There's absolutely no merit. And um, as far as I'm concerned, he should be ashamed uh, to call himself a physician. And just because you have an MD, it doesn't mean, um, doesn't mean much. It doesn't mean much anymore. I think it's meaning less and less because, it, you know, um, I took a Hippocratic oath to say do no harm, and there's just no way that this philosophy is not doing harm. It fly, flies in the face of everything. So, you know, he's not reinventing the wheel. I guess he's, I guess he's, he's suggesting that we go back to, you know, um, uh, hunting and killing things with our hands, and, and I, I kind of would dare to see this fella... Um, go into the woods and survive. And the last thing I'll say about that is the humaneness of it all and the violence of it all. We don't have to be violent, violent to feed, each other, feed ourselves now. You know, I, I think uh, the society, again, is much, you know, much more peaceful if we um, are eating plant foods. I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, the, we don't need to be aggressive. We don't need to inflict harm on people. We know that people that work in factory farms or butchers um, have a higher incidence of spousal abuse, violence, depression, suicides. You can't be in that environment all day long and not be affected by it. To suggest that we go and, you know, kill animals and to get their organ meat and that this is the way it should be and we should return to this kind of society is, is just abs absolutely crazy. I know that in my family of hunters, if I were to go back, I mean, again, they hunted less and less, um, even as I was growing up, because it wasn't a necessity to get meat. You know, when people are poor and they need access to food and they hunt, it's one thing. And they, and, but they do it, you know, I was always taught it was, it was done with respect, not as, as an act of violence, just because you can. And in this stage of the game, we don't need to. We know that it's more healthy to eat plants, to eat high fiber fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, it's better for you to have a garden, work out in your garden than it is to actively go to, you know, try to, um, to hunt something down. So, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see where, where this, is, this is all uh, something that, you know, we need to learn from our past and, and move forward. And there's enough violence in this world that we don't have to go back to our paleolithic uh, forefathers and hunt down animals and kill them just because we can because I, I just don't think that we, we, need, we need to. I think we need more compassion in our society uh, instead of less. And I think, you know, um, the, the, while I'm still ranting, I'm going to go on a rant of people not having time. Um, I've run into several occupations where people don't have time. They just don't have time to cook. They don't have time 
um, to exercise. Um, their time is not their own. And these occupations aren't occupations where there's life and death. Um, it's, it's a choice. And I think that as a society, we, we need to start to make time for things that we find important. And I guess it comes down to we need to make a list of what we find important. Most people would say that their health and their family are, are top on that list. Um, we all need to make a living, but it doesn't matter if you make a living if you don't have your health and you don't have a family. And as part of having a family, I think you need to be present for them and educate them, have dinner with them, speak with them, teach them what is important and teach them how to cook. Some of my best memories are being in the kitchen with my mother and my grandmother and being in the kitchen now with my daughter um, and cooking and, and shopping for food and, and preparing food and sitting down with family and having good food together. Um, we enjoy that. We enjoy that good food just like people did as, you know, in the past eating bad food. But it's, it's that, you know, sitting around the table and... Um, looking at each other, not having an iPhone out or an iPad. Uh, there's nothing worse than to, you know, see young mothers walking down the street with their iPad, iPhone in their hand and their, and their little kid walking with the iPad in their hand and nobody's communicating. Um, the only thing that can possibly be worse than that is I was running the other morning and saw a woman standing with her daughter at the bus stop vaping. I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it amazes me to see anybody smoking because we know that cigarette smoking is harmful. It causes cardiovascular disease and cancer, just to be, just to be clear. We know that vaping, uh, you, you know, I, I, I can't, I was trying to come up with something that is appropriate to inhale into your lungs besides oxygen, and I, and I couldn't find it. So why would we think that we need to inhale something, some stimulus into our lungs? There have been um, over 2,100 uh, serious illnesses from vaping this year and 61 deaths. It's widely publicized. Why would you stand there with a puff of smoke coming out with your six, seven-year-old standing beside you waiting for the bus? I couldn't, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I had to say something. And her response to me, I said, why would you vape in front of your child? Why would you vape? Why would, it, it causes serious health harm harm to you and into your lungs. And she says, no, I'm using a particular flavor. It's not harmful. Since when? You know, I, and, I, and finally, I, you know, I was bad. I, I said, you know, your, mom's, your mom uh, needs to stop that because she's going to get sick. And, you know, I, I just, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't see how she was, one, at the bus stop with other kids. So other kids were being exposed. You could smell the stuff. Smelled some like some sort of, you know, candy flavor of some sort. I don't know know what it was, um, but you know, exposing other other children to to that as well as you know her child. It reminded me of a time when I was a fellow in cardiology, and uh, one of my attendings, who wasn't a very pleasant guy, was talking about you know he used to make sure he got home after his kids were put to bed. Um, you know, because you didn't have to deal with the harassment, you know, the hassle of the evening and the crying about food and, and uh, bath time and whatever. And then the next sentence, he said, you know, I can go in, my teenage kids are sitting at the breakfast table in the morning and they don't even look up and speak to me. And he said, I don't understand why. And I thought to myself, one, you're not a very nice man. Uh, but two, your kids don't know you. Why would they spend it? You never gave them the time of day. Why would, why would they give you the time of day? And so I think sometimes when, you know, the teenage years are tough, but the teenage years are tough because they, you know, they get, children get to a point where they need some, some guidance, but they don't know where to turn because they, they, they don't know who their parents are because their parents were more interested in something else than them. So, you know, if I can give you a, a suggestion, uh, you know, that's every bit as important as eating your flavonoids and your fruits and your vegetables and spend time with your family. And, and make them number one and show them and teach them that their family will be number one and it is important to them. And the only way you can do that is to be present. And there's nothing better than sitting down with your family for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and, and speaking with them, enjoying a meal, enjoying cooking and preparation with your family. It's not a chore. 
It's a gift. You know, I have to say that I've observed in our nutrition classes, especially my Friday class, um, there's so much compassion for each of the members toward each other. Um, people pitch in to help. Last week we made soup to deliver to our elderly people that are in the practice. But everybody pitched in. We, we chopped the vegetables. We prepped, um, I think we had four or five Instant Pots going, um, made the soups, tasted the soups, you know, complimented each other on the different kinds of soups that we made helped put the soups in the jars and get them ready to go out to deliver. You know, um, people help get up and serve. They help with the cleanup. But they're also compassionate to each other. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a kindness there in that group. Um, we share food together weekend, uh, you know, week after week, year after year. And I think there's a closeness in a family that's developed uh, in these groups. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's, that's really nice to see that's, that's something much larger than I ever expected. Um, and, you know, we've watched a, a few um, YouTube videos on different things. And, um, you know, sometimes I'm better than others. I, I've hit, hit a chord or hit a nerve with some people. Um, but it's, it's, you can see the compassion that uh, people have for each other and share their thoughts and feelings and support. And it, it's, it's a really good thing. Uh, it's another reason why it never changed the way I practice medicine. Um, and, 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 and I'm honored to have this family of members in my practice um, that can sit down and have food together and enjoy and smile, but also be compassionate towards one another. The last study I'm going to talk about was one looking at um, menopausal uh, women. It's actually in the Journal of, of Menopause, looking at central obesity. Um, you know, we all tend to pack a little weight around our middle as we age, um, but that increases the risk for coronary artery disease. And this was actually a Korean women's study uh, that looked at women over 55 years of age um, that had uh, presented to the hospital with chest pain and they underwent cardiac catheterization. There were 659 uh, women, 47.2% of them ended up having coronary artery disease described as a greater than 50% blockage. And then they associated um, their waist circumference. And if their waist circumference was greater than 33 inches or 85 centimeters, they were more likely to have coronary artery disease than if they had a smaller waist circumference. And it was even more sensitive. Um, it was statistically significant where body mass index was not statistically significant. Um, when you look at body mass index, it, it takes in, uh, weight and height into consideration, but the waist circumference you know, it's looking more at central fat. And we know that central fat makes hormones, makes estrogen, makes platelet activating factors, makes growth factors that are more likely to get people uh, to have uh, the development of coronary artery disease. So, you know, it's another reason um, to, again, plant-based nutrition and uh, obtaining a lean body mass. And in women, sometimes that's very, it's much more difficult than in men. Men start out with more muscle mass than women. And at age 30, we all start to lose muscle mass. Vegans and vegetarians actually lose less muscle mass than the people that eat meat because of the leaching of calcium from the bone and the muscle uh, predominantly and the acid acidic nature of things. But nevertheless, if we don't do strength training exercises and uh, a lot of exercise and movement, we lose muscle mass. And when people overeat, they gain metabolic excess, right? So we gain fat mass. So you gain fat mass, you lose muscle mass, and the fat tends to go on in the central more portion. It tends to be white fat, white fat around the waist that is... Um, metabolically active in that it uh, hormonally active. So, you know, when women say it's easier for my husband to lose weight, it's true because men have more muscle mass, they have more mitochondria, they're going to process glucose better longer and they have a bigger gap. So when a man is, you know, 20, 30 pounds overweight, he is still, he can take in a lot of calories and still lose weight. You know, if somebody's 250 pounds, it takes 3,000 calories to maintain that. 
And so that weight's going to come off pretty quick. But when the men start getting down to where we're down to this abdominal obese, this abdominal adipose, then it becomes more difficult. And then we have to, we have to um, both men and women have to work on changing body composition. And exercise is going to be the best way to do that. So doing weight-bearing exercise, doing strength training, exercising, exercise, exercises, running um, are great ways to um, change your body composition. Improve mitochondria. When you improve your mitochondria, you're able to utilize glucose better and your metabolism improves and these hormones decrease and you have a better outcome and decrease cardiovascular disease. So short answer, we need plant-based nutrition and body movement so that we're not losing muscle mass and we're not getting metabolic excess and putting that adipose around our middles. Even if you look at, even if you look at skinny people after menopause, if they're eating standard American diet, uh, chances are they're going to have an increased waist-to-hip ratio. That puts people at risk for coronary artery disease. So even if the, even if the weight is not abnormally high, that increased weight is uh, it, the, the distribution because that fat around the organ, that, that fat that's making these hormones and growth factors is much more dangerous. All the sit-ups in the world is not going to really change that. It's your nutrition that's going to change it. And in general, building your leg muscles, building your arm muscles up. Before I leave, I'd like to make a shout out to all the members of our practice that aren't located here in good old Port Charlotte, Florida. I know a lot of you all listen to the podcast and I appreciate it. It's really good to um, have that community that extends outside of the town. I feel like I get to know our members outside of town almost as good as the members that I see every, every week in class. Um, because we take time to, to have talks, and they're part of our face group, Facebook group. They're part of our um, members-only website. But, uh, you know, I, I get to know them and a, and a little about them. And, you know, it, it, it's nice to know that, you know, everywhere out there and all you, that you people are, that are, are listening, um, that you want to make the world a better place and you want to get healthy and you realize that nutrition is the answer. And we love help, helping people get off their medications and actually reverse their lifestyle disease so that we can make people age. You know, I had a guy tell me this week that, you know, he, he's in his late 50s and he'd already had a heart attack, but he wants to turn back the clock. He wants to turn back the clock to 40, and there's no reason why he can't turn back the clock. Um, he's getting his weight under control. He's eating plant-based food. He's starting to exercise. Uh, there's no way that there's no reason why we can't turn back the clock. So um, we'll continue to support each other, and um, I hope that you'll join in and, you know, go sign up to run a marathon, come to our nutrition conference, join us in our immersion week, um, look on the, the website, join our practice. You can sign up for our newsletter. We'd love to have you. If you enjoy this podcast, I'd really like you to go over and give me a five-star rating on iTunes so that I can get more people. I want to get to a million downloads this year if we can. So um, help me to get there. Um, obviously, go over to Amazon and buy our cookbook, Plant-Based Wellness Cookbook, The Doctor, the Dietitian, and the Diva. It's a great gift uh, for people. It's a great gift to have easy, simple recipes to get you moving. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate your time. Have a good weekend.